Hi, Pastor Mike here with this week's View from the Pew. Actually, it's from this last Sunday. We're kind of behind um, due to a lot of moving and things going on in our lives. And uh, so a lot of things happening. And we all have very busy lives. And you know what? Sometimes it takes just stopping and saying it's time that I need to talk with the Lord. So let's do that right now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you in our those busy times to remind us that you're still there with us, that we need to be there with you as well. We ask your blessing upon all those that uh, worship at the crossings and the churches that we're affiliated with. Lutheran Church of the Master has been such a blessing to us lately. Lord, continue to watch over those people as well and all those listening to this podcast today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week we take a look at the gospel reading of John eight thirty one through 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The sin does not remain in the house forever. The Son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Awesome words for us this this week. The truth will set you free. Well, it's all a matter of balance, and that's my uh, discussion for tonight. A banker called in a certain man to talk to him about his account. Well, your financial affairs are a mess, he said to the poor man. Your wife constantly overdraws your account. She's behind in her charge accounts at the department store, and her check stubs are all added wrong. Why don't you talk to her about it? The man said, because I would rather argue with her or with you than with her. Well, there's a, there's a man who really needs some balance in his marriage, doesn't it? Balance. We're all trying to find it. Balance between work and leisure. Balance between job and family. Balance between time devoted to church and time for ourselves. Balance between the foods that we'd like to eat and foods that are good for us. Some creative person has done a satire on the creation story. Let me read a portion of it to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And G- and Satan said, it doesn't get any better than this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seeds, the true fruit bearing yielding fruit. And God saw that it was good. And Satan said, there goes the neighborhood. And God said, let's make man in our image. And so God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. And God looked upon man and woman and saw that they were lean and fit. And Satan says, I know how I can get back into this game. God populated the earth with broccoli and cauliflower and spinach, green and yellow vegetables of all kinds. So man and woman would have a long life, long and healthy with lots to eat. And Satan created McDonald's. The McDonald's brought forth the 99 cent double uh, double cheeseburger. And Satan said to man, you want fries with that? And man said, yes, supersize them. And man gained five pounds. God created the helpful yogurt that woman might keep her figure that man found so fair. And Satan brought forth chocolate and woman gained five pounds. And God said, try my crispy fresh salad. Satan brought forth Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and the women gained 10 pounds. God said, I have, I have sent the hard, healthy vegetables and olive oil from which to cook them. And Satan brought forth chicken fried steak so big it needed its own platter. God gained, or the man gained 10 pounds, and his bad cholesterol went through the roof. God brought forth running shoes, and man resolved to lose those extra pounds. But Satan brought forth TV with remote control that man wouldn't even have to toil to change the channels between ESPN and ESPN2. And man gained another 20 pounds. 
And God said, you're running up the score, devil. And God brought forth a potato, a vegetable naturally low in fat and brimming with nutrition. Satan peeled off the helpful skin and sliced the starchy center into chips and deep fat fried them, and he created sour cream dip to go along. And man clutched his remote control and ate the potato chips swaddled in cholesterol. And Satan saw that it was good. And man went into cardiac arrest. And God sighed and created quadruple bypass surgery. And Satan created Obamacare. Balance. It's hard to achieve, isn't it? Well, there's an ancient Spanish folktale about two tribes of people who live on either side of a mountain. On one side of the mountain, the village was all dressed in yellow, and they played all day long. Every day was a holiday, and every meal was a picnic. But even before they played all day, they weren't sure that they were happy. They had never done anything but play. On the other side of the mountain, the villagers dressed in black, and they worked all day. They worked hard all day, but they weren't very happy. They could do nothing but work. A wise man gathered both sets of villagers together on the top of the mountain for a conference. The playing people began insulting the workers, and the worker people began insulting the players. But a few words from the wise men, and suddenly no one was wearing all black or all yellow. They were wearing black and yellow stripes. And the people no longer wanted to just work or play. Instead, they wanted to do both. They worked during the day, and they played in the evening, and all the people were truly happy. A man tells about going to Okinawa and seeing people put huge loads on both ends of a pole, put the pole across their shoulders and walk for miles. He saw the same thing in China and on a farm in Barbados. The secret was the load had to be balanced. Balance is important in our lives. Anyone who loves nature knows how important balance is. A small Midwestern town once sponsored a coyote hunt because it Many farmers were losing chickens to predators. 1,500 coyotes were killed in a single weekend. However, within a few months, the entire community was overrun with rodents because their nat natural enemy, the coyote, had been eliminated. A year after that, the rodents weren't much of a problem anymore. The rattlesnakes were. Because there were so many rats and mice to eat, the poisonous snakes had produced rapidly. At this point, the chickens were safe, but humans were in danger. You see, the coyotes had been an important part of the environmental system of the food chain. When one part of the system chained, other parts adapted to the new reality. Well, this last Sunday, we celebrated Reformation Sunday. Balance is so important even in our lives and in our discussion of Reformation. That's true even understanding the nature of Christian life. Ever since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg, setting off the Protestant Reformation, the Christian community would struggle with balance between faith and works. You may remember the story of the rather nominal church member who lived with the philosophy that his good works would be more than enough to get him into heaven. One night he dreamed of the judgment. He was standing behind Mother Teresa, he panicked when he overheard God say, Teresa, I was really expecting a lot more out of you. Are we saved by faith or are we saved by good works? It's made headlines a couple of years ago when a group of Roman Catholic theologians agreed that, to a certain extent that Luther was right. Good works by themselves are not sufficient to heal the breach between humanity and God. Something more is required. And yet, what do we do with our other portions of Scripture that seem so adamant that a tall tree be known by its fruit? We even find this dilemma in our lessons for the day. In Romans 3.28, we read, So it is said that by faith in Christ and not by the good things we do. But then, in John 8.31, we read, Jesus said to them, You are truly my disciples if you live as I tell you to. Well, which is it? Is it faith or right living that makes it acceptable to God? A little balance is called for here. What is required of us? What is necessary? First of all, we need to acknowledge that God is the one who saves us. We are saved by Christ and by what he did for us and our sins on Calvary. That's grace. Paul writes in Romans 3.25, God sent Jesus Christ to take punishment for our sins. 
He used Christ's blood and our faith as a means of saving us. A few years ago, evangelist Ann Graham Lotz visited a woman on death row. The woman was convicted of multiple murders, not just one. During her time in prison, the woman had become a Christian. As her execution date approached, the woman became afraid that maybe her sins were too big to be forgiven. Maybe God's grace wasn't meant for someone like her. Anne asked the woman if she'd ever been to the beach. She said she had. She said, have you ever seen the holes in the sand? For instance, the ghost crab makes tiny pinholes in the sand. Little children dig out forts, making slightly bigger holes. And giant earth-moving equipment will dig even bigger holes. Well, Anne continued, when the tides come in, doesn't the water cover everything? It all becomes the same again. The holes are filled in. God's grace is sufficient to cover over any sin that we have, no matter how large our sin may be. Our faith is a response to Christ's saving action on the cross. We did not deserve for Christ to die for us. It was purely and wholly an act of God. The only requirement that God put on us is that we believe that Christ has saved us. The only requirement is that we must trust in the power of God's love for us. Having said that, though, it's equally true that saying, saving faith bears fruit. When the first bridge over the Mississippi was built, people refused to cross it. To overcome the fear, a herd of elephants led a parade across. Only then did the people believe in, in crossed that mighty, that mighty spans of man-made material. Then the people followed. In the same way, if I say that God so loved the world that God gave his son to die on the cross on my behalf, and I refuse to live a life of loving service in response to that act, there's a legitimate question whether I really believe that God's love is all that powerful. After all, faith and works are both a response to what God has done in Christ. In his book, Living the Faith, former President Jimmy Carter tells about a Christian layman involved in missionary work who approached a small village near an Amish settlement, seeking the pos possible convert. They confronted the Amish farmer and asked him, Brother, are you a Christian? The farmer thought for a moment and said, Wait just a moment. He wrote down a list of names and addresses on a tablet and handed it to the missionary. He said, Here is a list of people who know me best. Please ask them if I am a Christian. Certainly he had a point. Each tree ha is known by its fruit, said Jesus. So we are saved by faith. But are we saved by works as well? The answer to that is we are saved by God. Our faith and our works are just a simple loving response to what God's done for us in Christ. So, in other words, what we do creates for us an outward sign. God in us makes us happy and joyful people. We do the good work because of that. An African proverb puts it this way, God made the sea, we make the ship. We made the wind, we make, he, he made the wind, we make the sail. He made the calm, we make oars. My friends, that's balance. And that's this week's View from the Pew. Join us again next week for another edition of The View from the Pew.